lots of examples. That's what you're going to see today as we go over all the lenses that I use on a regular basis and what I use them for. And the good news, they aren't the most expensive lenses that are out there. So if you're looking for a new lens, we're going to save you some money. Now this setup I've got right here has been through many different refinements. I've tried a bunch of different lenses that on countless hours of research tested everything so you don't have to. All the timestamps for everything we're talking about today is down below if you wanna just skip to a chapter. So if you have an a7 III, an a7S III, an a1, an a7R, or even a newer Sony camera, you're looking at choosing some lenses, or you're not sure which lenses to get, this is gonna be a good video for you to watch. And in terms of what I shoot, it's a combination of a few things. Weddings is a big part, but also martial arts, commercial work, real estate, both photo and video, and obviously YouTube as well. But if you don't shoot any of that, and you're just a hobbyist that wants to capture family memories, once a month, I actually put out a video where I use one specific lens just to capture a bunch of different family memories and I make it into like a little short doc style film. I'll link one of those up there for you as well because they give a real great indication of how just using one lens can turn out for a video. Right, let's get on to all these lenses. So first up, we have the Sony 16 to 35 F4, which is my ultra wide, both for photo and video. It's a Sony lens, so the autofocus is as perfect as it can be. Most of the time, this is gonna be on a gimbal. If I'm at an event, doing establishing shots, showing a scene, or real estate, it's gonna be on a gimbal for the most part. In real estate, you need things to look big and wide. Spaces are often cramped and it's hard to show them nicely, so a super wide is what you need. And it's also fantastic for those big, wide landscape shots. Now, about eight months ago, I actually sold this, but I ended up buying it again after trying out a bunch of other different lenses but I always just came back to wanting this. And the big reason was the OSS, the optical steady shot that's built into this lens. If you wanna shoot handheld or if you need to do some form of vlogging, you can. 16 millimeter is a fantastic super wide vlogging length. You can see yourself, everything going on in the background. It's just my favorite length for vlogging. Now in terms of comparisons out there, the reason that this one stands out is because it's one of the only ones that has OSS. It's $900 cheaper than the GM F2.8, which is a bit dated now. It's also a lot smaller and a lot lighter. That lens is a monster. It's like $1,800 cheaper than the new 12 to 24 F2.8 GM, which again, doesn't have OSS. And then there's also the Sigma 14 to 24, which is ridiculously sharp. It's a beautiful lens, costs about $200 more than this, but again, doesn't have OSS. So if you need optical steady shot, this is the one you want. All right, but a lot of people say it's F4 and they get turned away from it. Let me tell you something, with super wide lenses, you really aren't seeing that huge amount of depth of field. That Bokeh look that everyone wants, unless you're really, really like close to the subject. With a super wide, it really isn't gonna be that evident. And let me tell you, if you are like super close like this for vlogging or something, it's not gonna look pretty anyway. And then people say, well, F4 isn't that great for low light. Well, not really that true. If you have an A7 III or higher, you can just crank the ISO and still get a decent image. F4 not being good in low light really isn't an argument anymore. And yes, there is the Tamron 17 to 28. I've done a video on why I still prefer the 1635. In short, OSS, better build quality, sharper, better autofocus. Not once has anyone ever messaged me saying that they regret purchasing this lens. So the 1635 F4 still remains my favorite ultra wide. Hey, if you like this video, chances are you probably will like the other videos I make too. So maybe try hitting subscribe down below. All right, thanks. All right, next up, the 24 GM. To this day, the only GM I've ever owned, and it's a pricey lens but it's a prime and it's entirely worth it. 24 mil is probably my favorite of all focal lengths out there. And that's why I invested in this special piece of glass. It's that sweet spot of wide where you can shoot, you can document a lot of things. You don't really ever feel like you need to grab a different lens. I normally feel like I can get everything I want with a 24. 24 works great for landscapes too. And if I don't need ultra wide, then I'll often use this on a gimbal as well. For events where I'm using a gimbal to walk around and capture different things, this lens. It's Sony, so the autofocus is impeccable. It's fast, it's accurate. No issues with breathing. All the bokeh that you could want in the world. All the light that you're ever gonna need, which for events like weddings is gonna be a lot because in the evenings it gets really dark. Even if you want f1.4 in the daytime, you just slap an ND on there and you're good to go. An incredibly sharp lens as well. I've shot an HD on this before, loaded it onto the computer and just questioned whether it was HD or 4K. Like, Honestly, if you try this, you'll see the same. Great lens for shooting B-roll of things. You can get in nice and close. Product photos look great with it. That background separation just works. And you wanna shoot Astro? 
great lens for it as well. For my martial arts content, I love using this lens handheld to get like a real super gritty look, like moving around in the moment action, getting in close, but having a wide field of view. I just really like that look. Following a movement for like punches and kicks, it's crazy how well the autofocus on this performs when I'm shooting that style of video. I'm literally shaking the camera around and it still works. Let's also not forget that this lens is pretty small. It's pretty light, it's an ideal run and gun setup. Also has a button on the side there so you can click and de-click the aperture to do it smoothly without it really being too obvious, you can do that. I'll often jump into crop mode with this as well just to get me a little bit extra reach. You can do the same thing with clear image zoom as well. In crop mode, it comes out to like a 36, which again is a really great focal range to shoot at. And nearly all my talking head segments like this, I use the 24 G Master. 24 is also a pretty good vlogging lens if you don't like that big super wide look. It's a little bit more intimate with this, but it doesn't really distort my face unless I get super close, so it's still a good lens for vlogging with. Obviously you don't have your OSS, so it's gonna be a little bit more shaky unless you're using like the A7S III, which has the active steady stabilization too. If someone said to me, you can only use one lens for the rest of your life, one focal length, one prime, this would be it without a question. Now, if you love the sound of all this, but you can't work with the price tag, because it's not cheap. There is a budget option from Viltrox, the Viltrox 24mm f1.8. Now I've done an entire review on this lens and the results are quite surprising. Add that to your watch list up there. If the 24mm is what you want, but the price tag is a little bit too hefty. I'm actually using that 24mm Viltrox right now to shoot this whole video. That's a pretty good test in itself if you're wondering how it looks. Next lens, the 55mm Zeiss. This is an older lens, but do some research and you'll still see that it's a very popular choice. And there's a reason for that. 55 mil is a very natural looking view, similar to what we see. And because of that, you can literally use it for anything you want. It's a great walkabout lens for stills and for video. Fantastic for corporate work, especially if you're shooting people in talking head style segments. Great for details, or for setting scenes at an event. Basically, anything that involves filming people, this is a lens that's gonna be on my camera at some point throughout the day. The natural look combined with it being f1.8 means you can blow out the background. You can use it in very dark situations. And in my opinion, it's probably one of, if not the sharpest lenses that I've ever used, which in some instances can actually work against you, shows you every perfection on someone's face, which some people won't like. So something to be aware of, it's too sharp, honestly. Also, it's tiny, really, really small. So you can conceal it, on a body, get some nice candid stuff without having a big camera set up in someone's face. It's a good thing. Negatives to be aware of with this lens, the focus distance, so how close you have to be to something or how far away you have to be from something, to focus on it is quite far, so something to be aware of. Also, as it's a bit of an older lens, the autofocus is incredibly accurate, but it's not as fast as some of Sony's newest glass, so be aware of that too. But this remains my choice in that 55, 50-ish focal range. Now, if you're wondering about other options, there is of course the brand new 50mm f1.2 GM, which is beautiful. It's a stunning lens, but it's like $1,200 more than this. So it's really not a budget-friendly option. And there's also the super budget-friendly FE 50mm f1.8, but the autofocus isn't the greatest on that. It's really quite slow. For video, it's not a lens you're gonna wanna pick. So the 55 is right in the middle price-wise and just, you can do any form of research, you'll quickly see that this is the top of a lot of people's lists. 55 mil F1.8 Zeiss. Right, next lens, the 90 mil macro. Now one thing to get out of the way quickly with this lens is just because it has macro in the title, doesn't mean it's just for macro. Yes, it works extremely well for that, and it's what I'm using to shoot all my super close-ups, product details, rings at weddings, those detail shots at weddings, but it's also an absolute stunner of a portrait lens. This is my go-to now for shooting at weddings, for events, when I'm shooting people from a distance. Think standing like halfway back at a wedding, right next to the guests, off to the side, just looking at the bride. That's about where I stand with this. It's razor sharp, not quite as sharp as the 55, but still a very, very sharp lens that just yields a beautiful image. Another massive benefit to this is one of if not the only Sony Prime lens that has OSS. So I can shoot handheld from a distance with no issue. I've actually gone an entire wedding reception, which is like the dinner speeches with just this lens handheld on my A7 III. That coupled with the fact that it's f2.8, so when it does get dark, which it will at a wedding, I can almost guarantee you that it's just a great lens to use. Now, one of my other favorite things about this lens is the clutch. So if I'm shooting macro or super close-ups, instead of letting the autofocus decide and often, it'll have a hard time 
even if you tap, just because the depth of field is far too narrow for extreme closeness. It's close, is that a word? We're gonna use it, closeness. Um, so you can just pop this back and manually focus with a nice big focus ring, which is like the perfect amount of firmness. So you can dial in exactly the part of the focus that you want. If you shoot weddings, events, portraits, especially with a two camera setup, you should absolutely have one of these in your bag. It's just a fun lens to use and just always produces such a pleasing image. Now alternatives to this lens, there's really only one other one I'm gonna talk about, but it's not a macro. And it's what I used before I had this. And that is of course the 85 mm f1.8. This isn't a lens I shoot with much anymore, but it's a lot cheaper than the macro. Prior to owning this, I just used this for pretty much everything. This was like my events lens. I used to use this a lot with APS-C cameras as well when I first started. Gets you like a 127 roughly. So really nice focal range for kind of keeping back and staying out the way. F1.8 for low light situations again, events, night portraits, this is a great option. For its cost, it's incredibly sharp. And if you don't like the 55 mil look, you want something that's a little bit more compressed, a bit of a longer focal range, 85 is a great option. Also 85 is one of Peter McKinnon's favorite choices for B-roll. He's done a whole video like covering that. That's because 85 just makes B-roll look like tasty. It looks good. Blurred background, sharp, like what more do you want? The 85 look is, is perfect for B-roll, honestly. So if the macro is out of your budget, and you still want something in that similar focal range, this is a great option for you. And if this is out of your budget, Viltrox actually makes an 85 version too. It's another one I've talked about before and reviewed. Saves you a further couple of hundred dollars. Autofocus on it is still great. That's not a bad option as well. But otherwise, this is a budget prime that you should be looking at. It will probably be one of the first budget primes that you stumble across, and it's a great starter lens. Next up, the 7200 f4, the staple white event lens. If you're an event and someone's shooting photos or videos, they will very likely have this lens. It's a lens that's commonly used for candid portraits at events, for getting that beautiful compression, a background blur. And the reason for that is that this is a lens that you can get in really close with, but actually stand quite far back from, which is great for getting candid moments on film or video. It's not film though, is it? It's digital. You know what I mean. If people know a camera is on them, they get uncomfortable sometimes. So you can stand far enough back with this that it's not an issue. It's a sniper lens. At a wedding during the ceremony, for my main angle during speeches, this lens is on one body 100% of the time. It has OSS as well, so if I wanna shoot handheld in a pinch, I could and it's not gonna be an issue. The difference of having OSS to not having OSS is a big deal and uh, it really does come in useful on this. I also shoot a lot of live fights when there's no coronavirus when I can. And I've often been stood at the edge of a ring on the ground, but I can still get in nice and tight. In some of my martial arts work as well, I've often used this lens to shoot during classes where martial arts is, uh, is being taught. And I can stand off to the side and really get into the action without being worried about being like kicked in the head or punched in the face or something like that, because it does happen. If you're at an event as well, being able to go out to 70, you're often stood back at the back anyway or off to the side, so you can still get a wider field of view as well. I really do love the ability to be able to go from 70 to 200 and just kind of chop and change between those two focal lengths in one lens. That can be a look in itself, like for martial arts stuff, to quickly zoom in like that. If you're shooting a fast paced video, I actually quite like that look and there's a time and a place where you can use that style of shot. I've even balanced this on a gimbal before to get some crazy parallax movements. Parallax is where everything kind of looks surreal as the way it's moving, foreground in front of the background, that kind of thing. If you watch Make Art Now, Josh often uses a 70 to 200 on a gimbal. Believe it or not, this lens is also sometimes used for landscapes. It can make things look a lot bigger or closer than they really are. It's just a fun lens to experiment with for shooting things that you wouldn't typically think of shooting with it. Also, it looks beautiful. Every single time I look at the video or photos from this, I'm just amazed, blown away by the image quality. This is a decent lens. I get asked all the time as well, why this over the f2.8? And there's two main reasons why I never even considered changing. First one's cost. This is $1,500 cheaper than the GM f2.8. It's also significantly smaller and at nearly half the weight as well. As I mentioned with the 1635, f4 is more than enough. You can boost your ISO to compensate for low light. And if you think that f4 isn't gonna give you some insane compression at 70 or even at 200, you are a little bit mistaken. It's a beautiful looking image. There's never been a time where I've thought to myself, ah, I just need that background to be a little bit more blown out. It's never happened. So in my opinion, there's really no reason to go for the GM, save your money, buy this. You can use that money I saved you to go and 
buy a different lens or a second body or something like that. Now, obviously you understand that to get all of these lenses, it's not cheap, so it's not gonna be for everyone. So if you are just looking for one lens to purchase, I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I've done a whole video covering that exact subject. Uh, but my recommendation is this guy right here, the Sigma 24-70 f2.8. I'll link it up there so you can go and check that out. Now I've also done a comparison between the 24-105 and the 24-70. This is an f4, f2.8. It's a whole video and a whole subject in itself. I'll link that one up for you there as well. So there we go. That is all of the lenses that I use, what I use them for with lots of examples. I hope this gives you some understanding of how you can use each one of these for different things. Big thing with lenses is remember that there really isn't any rules. If you want to just use a 7200, you can. If you want to just use a 24, you can. Don't let anyone tell you you have to use this lens for that thing. This is just me telling you what I use these for and showing you how they look in all those different situations. Thank you for watching. That's that. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.